Only one year after Joseph Rock arrived in China by chance in 1922, this wild-eyed Westerner became deeply enchanted by the town of Lijiang. His wild and restless character was calmed by this strange but charming place, and his stubbornness and conceit gave way to friendliness and trust through his dealings with the local Nashi people. After he completed his work for the US Department of Agriculture, Rock happened to witness a cruel but romantic Nashi ceremony for suicide-bound lovers. The moving ceremony had a profound effect on Rock. The eight young corpses hanging from the tree believed that their souls would travel on the wind over the mountains to a heaven on earth, the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon. When Rock realized that this heaven was an actual place, he embarked on a harebrained adventure to find it. But to reach the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon, he needed permission from the king of Muli. After a long year's wait, he was able to see the Muli king, but Rock's celebrity status was not enough reason for the king to immediately grant him permission. He was forced to twiddle his thumbs and wait patiently for the king's answer. On Rock's last night in Muli, the king took him to the top of a mountain from where he proudly showed him his land and his people. Muli is located in the central Hangduan Mountains on the southern edge of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau in southwest Sichuan province. The highest point is 5,958 meters above sea level and the lowest 1,470 meters. is located in mountainous terrain where climate, soil and vegetation conditions vary with the altitude. The area is home to countless exotic animals, numerous birds and valuable plants, as well as abundant natural resources. But most of Muli's residents were poor because of the kingdom's location in the mountains, the scarce farmland and the king's lack of interest in the welfare of his people. Looking out, they saw in the distance huge snow-capped mountain peaks protruding through the clouds and mist. The king pointed to the snowy mountain and explained that this area was called Kungka Rizum Gungba, and that according to Tibetan Buddhism, the three bodhisattvas lived on the three snow-capped peaks. Thus, this made them the most famous holy peaks in the region. In Tibetan, they are called Shambhala or Shangri-La. Rock was amazed that he was actually looking at the long dreamed of earthly paradise. But the king told Rock that there were violent armed gangs of lawless bandits that respected no one, not even the king himself. He advised Rock not to go there. In point of fact, the king's recommendation was an order ending Rock's plans. Rock could only stare wistfully into the distance.
The many courses served at that night's banquet didn't make much of an impression on Rock. Only dessert seemed to excite him. He later recalled it was a bowl of steamed milk custard served without any eating utensils. Rock watched the king to see how it should be eaten. The king stuck out his long tongue as he brought the bowl up to his mouth. But although it was the most appetizing dish of the night, Rock's tongue was not long enough to reach the custard. The next day, perhaps out of compassion or generosity, the king agreed to have his photo taken. Although this did not make up for not being able to see the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon, it was a form of reward for all his work. History is full of surprises. Neither the great king of the mountains nor the western explorer had any idea that this photo would make them both famous the world over. Rock suspected the king had refused as much because Rock was an outsider as because he was concerned for his safety. Rock was bitterly disappointed, partly because of the setbacks in his adventure and partly for the plant and animal specimens he would miss. But he was most disappointed because his dream of reaching Shangri-La was slowly evaporating. While reading Dumba scriptures one quiet night, Rock's thoughts suddenly turned to the souls of the young people who had committed suicide. He used to get excited by rare animals and plants that had survived the last mass extinction and were a shortcut to his success. The locals with whom he'd been interacting had really been a means to an end. He suddenly realized that these means were what he truly wanted to understand, so that he would no longer be an outsider. That night, Ronk had a strange dream in which he returned to the mountainous fairy tale land of Muli. He dreamt of its beauty and tranquility, its simple and honest people who lived there, and their kind and compassionate king, and even its gold and unusual food. We've uh, invited uh Richard Warburton has 40 years experience in hotel management and personnel training. In addition to this film, Richard was also involved in organizing a 10-day forum on high-end tourism in Lijiang, which brought together senior managers from all of Lijiang's hotels. Share ideas and discussions, and uh, we, we can have an open, open discussion.
people with a sort of professional international um, approach to the people who come here so that they receive the standards of service here that they would get anywhere else in the world and hopefully to, to keep people coming back to Lijia in the area. It, his sort of contributions came from his research here that was fed back to um, for example the states in terms of uh, perhaps cures for various diseases. After he came back from Muli, Rock developed a strong interest in the unique and mysterious Nashi culture. Although he had failed to reach the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon, Rock believed that if he could learn to read and understand the Nashi Dungba scriptures, he would at least eventually understand the true significance of the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon to the Nashi people, and this would be some consolation. After his trip to Muli, Rock travelled widely in western Yunnan, the southwestern tip of Mongolia, and the grasslands of northeastern Tibet. He collected plant and animal specimens and made friends with the people he met. He also tried repeatedly to contact the king of Muli through his friend A Yunchan, but was not successful. Back in Chusung village, Rod began learning the Dungba scripts and organizing large performances of Dungba ceremonies. He also used the National Geographic Society's film to take many photos of Buddhist ceremonies and religious clothing in Yongning County, home of his friend A Yunshan. For Rock, the next two years passed very quickly. One day in 1926, Rock heard the sound of horns and the beating of drums coming from the village. Rock knew from his studies that the Daji Fung ritual was held for people who had died of unnatural causes other than war, usually for people who had sacrificed their lives for love. The Na Shi believe spirits called Feng Gui oversee the spirits of those who died for love. At the end of the ceremony, the Dungba practitioners smear chicken blood on the memorial tablets of the deceased. The Feng Gui, however, are reluctant to leave, so the tablets are smashed to pieces, symbolizing the life and death struggle with the spirits. Eventually, however, they win the battle and drive away the Feng Wei. This is known as Da Ji Feng. Rock once wrote, when the lovers die, they become wind spirits, like Dante's Paolo and Francesca, whose spirits drifted away so lightly on the wind. Nashi people believe that people who choose this decisive form of death have no desire to remain on earth. Therefore, the Dungba practitioners drive the spirits out of their village to ensure that their children are never tempted to take this irreversible path of suicide.
During the intervening two years, Rock wrote to the Morley King several times but received no answer. His patience running thin, Rock decided to change tack. Without telling the king, he assembled a team and set off for Morley. Just before he arrived, he dispatched a messenger to tell the king he wanted to go to Da Jianlu to carry out scientific experiments. He had got along well with the king last time, and when they met again this time, it was like a meeting of old friends. Rock presented the king with a recent US magazine, which included an essay Rock wrote about the king and the king's photo on the cover. When he saw this, the king gladly granted Rock's request and wrote a letter to the Konka bandit leader, Jasi Zongban. The Mount Kungka region is divided into three areas, Dongyi, Xiangchang, and Daocheng. Each area was governed by a local leader who in turn was governed by a Tibetan leader named Jiaxi Zongban. Jiaxi Zongban was the real head of the Mount Kungka region. Rock decided to stay with the king for a while longer to ensure the Mount Konkar gangs had time to receive and understand the contents of the Muli king's letter. Rock, naively, did not realize that the armed gangs on Mount Konkar had no time to read the Muli king's letter. That day, a man wearing strange clothes and carrying a rifle arrived at the king's palace in Muli. Thinking this was strange, Rock quietly followed him. Young Lama led the man into the king's palace. He was the leader of the Dong Yi area, and he claimed a Mo Suo man had recently robbed and murdered a man from Dong Yi in Yongming. He wanted to pass through Muli on his way to seek revenge. To Rock's surprise, the king agreed to his request. Then Rock suddenly remembered his friend Ah Yunchan in Yongning and became concerned. Rock immediately wrote a secret letter warning Ah Yunchan of the attack and asked one of his guards to deliver the letter. Ah Yunshan then told the people of Yongning to prepare for the attack. Rock did not realize, however, that his actions had placed him at great risk. The armed gangs of the Mount Konkar area were on the brink of war, so Rock once again put his plans on hold. He took the opportunity to return to the United States to seek more financial support from the National Geographic Society to collect more plant and animal specimens. In reality, though, Rock had already shifted his focus to the culture of the mysterious land of Shangri-La. Not only had Rock's expedition impacted the tranquility of the region, but the region's cultural environment 
and also had an impact on rock. While in the US, Rock unexpectedly received a letter from A Yuan Shan telling him that the bandit leader Jashi Zongban had agreed to Rock's request. Rock was ecstatic. On March the 23rd, 1928, he left the US and hired new helpers in Lijiang. After completing all the necessary preparations, he hurriedly set off on his third trip to the land of the kingdom of the Jade Dragon. Rock arrived in Muli in early June. Although the king was away, he had arranged everything for Rock before he left, including a team of soldiers as escorts. Rock's expedition team consisted of 36 mules and 21 Nashi helpers, his largest expedition in China to date. Rock was particularly grateful that the Muli king had appointed the head lama from the Muli temple as expedition guide. Only the head lama would be able to acquire the food they needed along the way from the poor locals. The head lama faithfully conveyed a message from the king. Although the expedition could travel to Kungka Rizum Gungba under no circumstances should they stay too long in any one place, and it would be best to avoid the Mount Konka Monastery. Rock was overjoyed that the expedition was going ahead and was keen to get to the Holy Mountain. set off the next day at daybreak. But just as his caravan was about to enter the Mount Konka region, the head lama mysteriously began to fall farther and farther behind. Rock eventually realized that the lama's magical strength was diminishing the father he got from home. Without his followers by his side, the monk had begun to fear the legendary barbarity of the Garu people. According to Rock's notes, the Garu were tall, fit and fearless warriors who wore their hair in braids similar to the Native Americans. When the expedition team set up camp in Garu, a warrior who was Jashi Zongben's elder brother approached Rock on behalf of his brother to learn about Rock's expedition. safe with the guards by his side. But he was furious with the weak and frightened Lama. After the Garu warrior left, the Lama begged Rock to abandon the expedition, saying that the king's soldiers were afraid for his safety, and because of this, everyone had decided not to continue. This greatly angered Rock. He yelled at the head Lama to write to the Muli king, telling him that the soldiers he dispatched were all struck with terror and request that the king dispatch new ones. You will do it now! I 
Brock spent the whole day angrily shouting at the men and trading threats with them. Unable to dissuade Rock, the Lama prayed and burned paper inscribed with lines from scripture with cypress tree branches, begging the spirits to protect them as they neared the holy mountain. Everyone seemed to be aware of the imminent danger they faced. To commemorate the team's courage and the team's fears, Rock took a photo of the group. One can clearly see from the photo the unrestrained look of pride on Rock's face and the bravery and fearlessness of the Nashi soldiers by his side. The journey was extremely difficult. Torrential rain in the Yaka mountain pass caused them to lose their way. That night, they set up camp on Mount Konkar below a hanging glacier at about 2,000 feet above sea level. When the clouds eventually cleared, they saw the mountain resembled a truncated pyramid flanked by shorter, broad peaks. Rock sipped his wine in the cold night air below the holy mountain, contentedly listening to the occasional pieces of ice rolling down the mountain. Chonggu Monastery sits at the foot of one of the peaks of Mount Konka. Jashi Zungben had already sent word to the monastery to accommodate Rock and his team. Rock was therefore given the best room in the monastery. The feeling of living in the clouds roused Rock's spirits, and he was eager to sit down to dinner and enjoy this unique feeling. However, Rock and his companions were unaware that the monastery was the former home of the leader of Dong Yi. Mysterious strangers quietly observing this strange white man's every move struck terror into the head lama's heart. He tried to convince Rock that they should set off the next day, but Rock firmly refused and patiently tried to ease the lama's fears. Although Rock felt safe, the fact was some of his team already lay buried in the ice and snow around the mountain. The surrounding land was no man's land and criminals of all types were everywhere. But Rock thrived on this feeling of danger.
The next morning, Li Shuqian panicked when he found Rock wasn't in his room. Rock had spent the morning walking alone in the meadows and climbing the mountain. He was certain that the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon would at last be found here. It was June and the weather was overcast and changeable. The snowstorms raging above in the 5,000 meter high snow capped mountains made it impossible for Rock to see the mountain clearly. By this time, it had been five years since Rock had unexpectedly witnessed the Daji Fung ritual that changed his life forever. And not a day had gone by in those five years when he hadn't looked forward to this day. Now, he was really here in a place that seemed worlds away from his starting point. He considered that the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon could be just a paradise in people's imagination. This heaven on earth might only be a myth spread by word of mouth. When Li Shuqian found Rock out walking alone, he angrily dragged him back to the monastery. Confined to the monastery, Rock felt bored and decided to tour the temple to pass the time. He asked some lamas about the temple, but strangely, None of them knew its history. This made Rock wonder why the monks engaged in leisurely meditation when people could not freely travel to and from the region due to the armed gangs. Calling the advice of the Muli king, Rock's heart turned to ice. At that moment, his guard Li Shichen told him that the monastery was controlled by the leader of Dong Yi, who was a member of an armed gang. Rock then remembered that a year before, the leader of the Dongyi had asked the Muli king's permission to attack Yongning. Rock suddenly realized the gravity of the situation. He told his guards and helpers to quietly pack the luggage so they could leave the next day. And he also took out his pistol hoping he would still not need to use it. That was June the 25th, 1928. You never know what fate has in store. The next day at daybreak, the Lama guide for Rock's expedition came screaming into the courtyard where Rock was staying. Rock 
quickly ran outside to see what the cause of the commotion was. this about what he saw next. She was the finest mountain my eyes ever beheld. The snowy pyramid was grey, but the apexes of both it and Shenrezig suddenly turned a golden yellow as the sunrise kissed them. Rock had waited five years for this moment. But now, words failed him. There were simply no words to describe this heaven on earth. Records indicate that Rock never took another photo of a holy mountain that satisfied him. As he stood at the entrance to this heaven on earth, Rock's heart was pounding. The third kingdom of the Jade Dragon was an elusive paradise. Although its beauty was beyond imagination, Rock was certain that people did not come to this high place to live after death. The lovers who had considered death to be like going home could never find happiness and joy on top of this barren mountain. Rock finally realized in that moment that the dreamlike third kingdom of the Jade Dragon had been designed by the Dungba practitioners to ensure that those who committed suicide would never want to return to the human world. For safety's sake, Rock left Kungka Rizum Gungba once he had seen the snow-capped mountains, but he quickly regretted it. At the end of 1928, he wrote again to the Muli King about returning to Mount Kungka. The Muli King readily agreed to Rock's request and made the necessary arrangements. But then two letters from the King arrived shortly after the expedition set out. One of the letters was from the Muli King asking Rock to forget about returning to Mount Konka. The other letter was from Jashi Zongben to the Muli King. That letter said, if the white man returns, we will not listen to the Muli King. We will slaughter the expedition team because the deceitful white man secretly tipped off Ah Yun Shan. At the end of the letter, the Muli King advised Rock to head instead for Yongming. Rock had no choice but to go to Yongning, but he still fantasized that perhaps one day the armed gang on Mount Konka would forget about what happened. But a few days later, another letter from the Muli King informed Rock that the gang had not forgiven him and was sending some hundred men to attack Yongning. It was obvious Rock couldn't wait it out at Lugu Lake, but there were no boats to take him across the Jinsha River due to fighting between warlords in Sichuan and Yunnan. Ah Yunshan therefore quickly assembled a group of men to help Rock and his team escape from Yongning. On 
On October the 13th, more than 20 brave Nashi began two days of 24-hour work to ferry Rock, his team, their luggage and their horses across the Jinsha River in a small sheepskin raft. One important reason for Rock's legacy is his photography skills and the pictures he took. It's clear that he didn't take these photos for the money, but as eternal mementos of each thrilling moment of his journey. The holy Mount Konka was now off limits to Rock. Rock was never able to return to the holy mountain. But during those five unforgettable years, Rock realized that the Dongba scriptures were the oldest extant records of primitive human thought still in use. Other cultures would impact Li Jiang in the future, just as Han marriage customs impacted the open marriage custom of the Na Shi. Eventually, the traditions and culture of the Na Shi would disappear. With this in mind, Rock returned to the US and asked the National Geographic Society to fund his research into Dongba literature. But the society didn't believe his research would help the circulation of their magazine, and so they declined Rock's request. Moreover, the 1929 stock market crash was about to hit the United States. The economic crisis brought to an end the nearly 10-year relationship between Rock and the US Department of Agriculture, the Harvard Arboretum, and the National Geographic Society. Rock's glory days were now over. Rock was initially motivated solely by fame and fortune, but his search for the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon had changed all that. What would he do now that money and fame had deserted him? Rock unexpectedly used the money from selling all his belongings and even his entire retirement fund to pay for a trip in the 1930s back to a village beneath the snow-covered Yulong Mountains. There, he lived alone, researching and translating Dongba scriptures. Li Jiang was now his real home. He said he could not leave such a beautiful place or abandon his friends who had trusted and helped him. He told his friends that when he died, he wanted to be buried in the village. But as war raged in the Pacific in 1944, Rock heard that the Japanese were planning to attack Yunnan. Concerned, he filled two cases with over a decade of research notes and translations and sent them back to the United States on a mail steamship. Incredibly, the steamship hit a Japanese submarine in the Indian Ocean, causing the ship to sink. Over 10 years of Rock's hard work sank 
to the bottom of the ocean. The tragic scene of the Daji Fung ritual 20 years earlier was deeply ingrained in Rock's soul, and it led him to search for heaven on earth. It was the first time he had felt insignificant. In that desolate, snow-covered land with his team, he finally understood what it meant to share a common destiny. 20 years in history is but a blink of the eye, but for Rock, it was a lifetime. His life of searching and exploring suddenly came to an end as if he were waking from a dream. Rock told a friend that he had seriously contemplated suicide. He was afraid he would be unable to rewrite from memory the material he had lost. In this film, there are two stories of suicide. The first is about the eight Nashi men and women who committed suicide for love. The other is about Rock himself. For the actors, acting out these two stories was somewhat like torture. Well, plus, this shouldn't happen. You know. Okay, it, it, it has been a cultural thing. Uh, but if people are ambivalent about whether they live or die, usually through counseling or talking to somebody, they, they can sort of find a way forward. You know. And ambivalent being so that they don't really care one way or the other. But if they can get help and talk to somebody, that, that will see them through. commit suicide. Instead, he gave his gun to a friend in Kunming and restarted his colossal research project. Six years later, in 1949, Rock regretfully left Lijiang. On June the 18th, 2010, filming of this documentary was completed. Though the film is complete and Richard Warburton has changed out of Rock's clothes, his work in Li Jiang is far from finished. He recently, for example, organized a forum on high-end tourism in Li Jiang. Even though Rock and he are both from Europe, Richard admits that his knowledge of Rock is limited especially concerning what Rock did after he left China. Thirteen years after he left Li Jiang, Rock still often thought about returning to Shangri-La, to the place where he spent so many years, and to the people who inspired and moved him. But on December the 5th, 1962, in Hawaii, Rock died from an illness. He finally went to the third kingdom of the Jade Dragon to continue his journey. During his last 13 years, however, he managed to rewrite the materials he had lost and he eventually published several books on Nashi culture, including a Nashi English Encyclopedic Dictionary and the ancient Nashi Kingdom of Southwest China. In his preface to The Ancient Nashi Kingdom of Southwest China, Rock wrote, 
when I write about the territory of the Nashi people. I keep recalling what I saw there. It had a beautiful landscape, wonderful forests and flowers, and friendly tribes. I will always be happy for the rest of my life to recall my Nashi people, with whom I have developed an intimate friendship over a long period of time.